Hi, I'm Julia Bianco Scheffling. I'm the author of The Art and Business of Acting for Video Games and the COO and Casting Director at the Help Network. And you are watching the Points of Experience podcast. As just stated, Julia Bianco Scheffling, the casting director of some of my favorite titles, the best titles I have ever played from a voice acting perspective and just all around game. I mean, we're talking Zelda Breath of the Wild, which led to them now doing her company, The Help Network, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, this little baby right here, Gotham Knights, Cyberpunk 2077, Hyrule Warriors, Tell Me Why, Secret of Mana, Crash Bandicoot, um, really a phenomenal human being with tons of information about this industry, and despite her desire, at first she went ahead and created a gold standard resource for us, which is her book, um, the art and business of video games. I probably just said that wrong now. Um, the um, the business of acting in video games. Sorry. Um, I own this book. I cannot recommend it enough. Please buy it. The link is in the description. I'm going to talk about it all throughout this episode. I'm going to talk about performance capture, motion capture, all the different intricacies, where the industry is going with video games, things you can do as an aspiring actor or an actor who's already working. By aspiring, I want to make sure I'm being clear and saying somebody who has never done anything in the acting sphere. Um, as someone who's an aspiring actor um, or as a working actor, someone pursuing acting because actor, an actor is an actor is an actor, which is something this is a, a very important line in her book um, and a thing to recognize for people who work in the voice acting space. Um, a lot of great stuff in the episode. I, I could sit here and sell you on it more, but the only thing I'm going to sell you on is making sure you hit the subscribe button and the like button and leaving us a review and all the stuff that I said on and on and on and on because a lot of you are not subscribed. And if you're not subscribed, you're not going to get the notifications on when we release new episodes. And it just helps us make more great stuff. Um, you know, we do this for free. And um, if you want to support us, you can go ahead and do it by doing that. So I will say no more. Like, subscribe. Do it all. Do it all. Do it all. Do it all. Okay? Done? Great. Because uh, we're going to go ahead and get to the episode. And uh, it's right now one of the best resources I could say in addition to her book on the video game industry. This episode, I'm going to even title it as such. Um, Julia Bianco Scheffling, coming up. If you like video games, if you want to be a part of them from an acting perspective, this is the episode to listen to, so listen all the way through. Coming up next on the Point of Experience Podcast. Julia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am unbelievably excited to talk with you about so many things, but most of which is sitting right behind you, which we've just been talking about, is your book, The Art and Business of Acting for Video Games. Uh, I am, I'm ecstatic to dive into this and all of the things that you have provided as resources for not only working, but aspiring and anybody who's been curious about what the video game industry is. So before we hop into all that, just thank you and how are you? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's it's hump day. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Uh, we're heading into summer break. I have a kid, so that makes a big difference in life and and schedules and things. Um, and uh, and I'm doing well. I'm ready for the sun to come out. Yeah. Well, it was out for like a, a hot minute, and then as I was driving back, uh, because as you know, and I was telling you, I was at a vet, and then like I saw like. The you know the it just everything was turned to like really dark and I was ominous and I was like whoa what did I just what did I just come into? It's like Midwest weather all of a sudden, right? Exactly. <laughs> LA is a very interesting place this past year. It's been freezing up until now, and but apparently that's common for some extent. I don't know. I'm I'm new to as I as I believe you are a a New Yorker. Uh, me coming from New York to here, this is all very weird to me. Um, it was, but I've been here for 20 years. Okay. 20 plus years. So, yeah. <laughs> so, do you consider yourself a New Yorker still, or have you, or do you consider yourself an Angelino at this point? Um, I'm a New Yorker at heart, but I don't identify, like, I don't know anything about <laughs> it now. And so, I know a New York that was, was definitely a long time ago. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's, I, I go back pretty frequently, and it, even every year, I've only been in LA since 2020, but every year I go back um, since then, things change. It's a little bit different. Stores that you used to go to aren't there anymore. Your favorite shops. It's, it is an ever-evolving uh, beast, Manhattan. It's, it's loving and scary and intimidating, but it has uh, so many wonderful things for artists and actors. Um, 
but I, I think LA is a really wonderful place too to pursue a lot of things, namely video games. I've I, it has been kind of like the um, the shining uh, example of where you can. I, although we'll and we'll talk about this, remote recording is a very viable thing, and a lot of studios are very open to doing it. Um, what I have seen from New York to LA is that this is really where most of the studios are based and have originated and are doing a lot of this work. So in terms of networking or being uh, around that type of environment, it's really kind of that place. Do you still agree with that? Or do you think that it, there's maybe other places popping up that are, are starting to make a name for themselves in terms of video games? I think there are people who are making names for themselves in other places that have like solid remote setups and have been able to break in to mm. what was kind of an L.A. only scene. Um, but I, I still think the primary uh, jobs are here, especially because of the performance capture aspect. And that's such a growing aspect. And, and so just the majority of, of stages are here and. You know, clients also got used to the rates of L.A. studios versus New York studios, so it's not always uh, preferable to record in other places that may or may not be more expensive. So there's just a lot of considerations because the volume, there's there's a lot of dialogue. So um, budgets uh, are based on, you know, where you record. Yeah, no, that's very true, and I, th I don't think that's something people really think about, and especially from the motion capture, which is one of the things that I truly love that you go in depth with in this book, because I feel, and I'm curious how you feel, the industry with a lot of these contemporary games, while not every game has performance or motion capture or facial capture, it seems like that is a tool that is being explored more and more as graphics evolve and as these games get more advanced and they are more interactive. Do you feel that, that is, uh, those types of jobs are popping up more from you from clients? Do you feel like that is becoming more popular, popularized? And as a result, from an acting perspective, it might shift things as they, they had gone remote to, if you want to be involved with that, to having to be uh, either available or flexible to being open to going to these studios. I know it's a lot there, but I hope it's yeah, it's yeah. I think just generally, it is. Um, it's it's kind of known for the people in in the working industry that if you're not in LA, you have to have ha had an established career mm. in order to justify people kind of flying you out uh, or being willing to consider someone that is not in LA. Yeah. Uh, even if you're a local hire, it's really hard because schedules change. Uh, and they change kind of a lot and, and they may not lock your mocap schedule until the week before. And I guess that's how it is in film too, but they don't have the kind of budget to like change people's flights and, and make those accommodations. Yeah. Um, so it's just easier for them to use local actors. The other thing is with performance capture, motion capture, while it, the goal is always to preserve the, like most of the performance. Uh, so performance capture would be like face, body, and uh and voice they can do a lot if you're not available mm. someone can do the body that day and it, it would be very difficult for a consumer to notice something like that uh, it's not ideal it's not what anybody wants to do but it's um it makes it difficult to consider kind of flying people out <laughs> sure no that's a, it's a big expense oftentimes with these very tight budgets for certain things especially for indie studios that are maybe exploring this so that's an expense that maybe they might say well we're gonna do a more viable option for whatever reason um it's it i i really appreciate how in depth and how much you cover in your book and it is uh one of my favorite resources right now to reference and one of the newest resources and and you strike me as somebody who is very uh committed to education and resource and community you are involved in so many different facets of this industry not just as a casting director but also having the help network and all the various uh subsidiaries, I guess you could call them, that are existing with what you do. Um, I would love to dive into a lot of those, but I want to make some comments really quickly about the book. Um, one of them firstly being, and you say this a couple of times, is an actor is an actor is an actor. And I, I truly appreciate that someone coming from a theater and film and TV background, diving more into voiceover, treating it that way for me has been so, um, I think not only like lucrative in terms of booking things, but it's, it's allowed me this freedom to not think like, 
and you state this too, is you don't have to identify as a voice actor. You are an actor that happens to be using your voice or your body if it's performance capture or a uh, face if you're using facial capture. So that groundedness and you know restating of an actor is an actor is an actor, I think is one of the most helpful things that you can say and it, and it uh, illuminates so much about the, the voiceover industry, especially the way it's heading in terms of video games and the style that these, these studios want. Yeah, you know, I think it's um, it's a principle that got lost a little bit, especially because in games, you know, it, it, the use of actors is fairly new. Mm. Um, you know, it was a lot of uh, bodies versus actors. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I do think, you know, and I, I do talk about it a bit in the book, but there's a convergence of, of media happening. And it's not uh, forward thinking to put everything in boxes when uh, it is ultimately going to get so blurred that, it, you know, being a TV actor versus a film actor versus a VO actor, I mean, you're going to need to use all of those elements eventually. Um, and especially with like social media and influencing and there's just so many facets now mm. that I think it's just... Um, uh, short-sighted not to think of it as a a well uh, a rounded thing now it's totally okay to focus on those things sure. and like there are a lot of people that don't ever want to be on camera in any way and that's performance capture or motion capture or any of it um but there's there's a lot of people that do and so you you just should distinguish it uh you should be careful about distinguishing yourself as a particular kind of actor if you want to do all of the things or be Which, open to do all of the things. Yeah, and especially from a career perspective, I mean, like you said, some people may not have any interest in doing on camera or theater, whatever it is, um, even though from a training perspective, I think all of those things help even if you don't even if you're going to limit yourself to what you want to do, but from... agreed. And that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when hopefully we could talk a little bit about the, the training aspect of things, but uh, especially for people to make a sustainable career uh, monetarily uh, ha having yourself available the same way. If you want to take the subcategories of voiceover of promo and video games and commercial and narration, you know, on a resume, you don't have to list that I am a, a narration actor, a, a you know, like a, a print actor, a uh, whatever it is that, you know, that list would go on forever with all of the various forms of acting, which are all acting. It's all acting yeah. at the end of the day. Um, when did that become when did you notice that that is something that needed to be reinst like reinstilled into the community or into the the conversation? Um, I experienced a couple clients who had biases against people who had voice actor versus just actor or not saying anything um, on their resumes and, for performance capture jobs. Mm. And especially when they were really starting to kind of use non-game actors for PCAP. Sure. And they started looking at TV people, if you will, and um, just actors who are more known for those other media types. They, they, they didn't, they, they discriminated against voice actor because they were uh, afraid that they were someone that wouldn't be able to use their body. Mm -hmm. And, and to be fair, that is true to a certain extent because people spend so much time trying to, uh, fit your performance into a microphone versus the other way around. So yeah. it can take some jogging of the memory. It can take a little bit of learning, but, um, again, if the base skills are there, then there's no reason why. And so I just didn't want people to get an unfair chance or, you know, not get a chance because of something as silly as that. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a, a dated ideology in terms of this industry. But like you said, there is, you know, I meet a lot of people going to conventions and stuff too, and they, they're, uh, I, I'm sure you see the same trend too. A lot of people are fans of video games or anime, and that is the thing that they want to do. And so that's a separate conversation where it's like, well, you're limiting yourself from that perspective, but also having the understanding of not just using only from here up 
which creates a, an, an authentic or, or moving performance, but how to incorporate your body to create nuance. And that is something I feel like you is so illuminated in the performance capture. And you talk about this in the book too, but like even going from like, what is your pedestrian walk? What is like, what are the various forms of walking that this character inhabits? Or if you're playing multiple characters, do they have the same walk? And if you've never done that, or if you've never thought of yourself as an actor first, that I could feel like could be inhibiting. Uh, do you do you see that a lot with people uh, when you're working on the, the, the performance capture stage where you have to maybe remind people of these things or is that something a director is really kind of, um, do you see them focusing a lot on those little nuanced things if they're, if they're someone who traditionally would have labeled themselves as a voice actor? Um, in the audition phase, because those in those auditions, um, a lot of times we're either doing in person or Zoom mm -hmm. callbacks, and in that callback, we're really um, focusing. There's usually an animator sitting there, uh, so there's an animator or you know the head of animation or art. Then there's the narration people listening more for the voice side of things, and then there's me who sometimes expresses the opinion if it's strong, but otherwise it's really their decision. And my job was to bring you in the room and and show the best you know of yeah. your abilities, uh, and then answer any questions about your abilities as well. Um, and I think in those settings, you would be surprised um, that a lot of people kind of forget that their hands are attached to their wrists <laughs> or things like that. Um, but then there's also people that just totally surprise you and that are incredibly natural. And, and uh, we still love auditioning uh, voiceover people, if you sure. will, voice actors, if you will, for these roles because it's still a primarily a voice job a lot of times. Like there is 3,000 lines of dialogue and your 20, 30, 40 pages of mocap, uh, you know, or PCAP work. So it's, it is not as easy to get, you know, TV film uh, non-VO folks yeah. to lay down 3,000 lines. Um, and to th handle battle chatter or handle any of that kind of stuff. I mean, we do it and they do it and we figure it out, but it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely easier the other way around. So there tends to be a, a, f a favoritism, if you will, on some teams, if they're not focused on kind of celebrity yeah. to, to wanting people with the, the strongest voice performance and the other things can kind of be fixed in post, if you will. Mm, yeah. And you start the book off with an example of this where uh, there's a celebrity figure working on this game. And for people who may not be familiar, you know, if a game is being done and you can correct me if I'm wrong at any time, please feel free to <laughs> correct any <laughs> misinformation I might provide here. I disclaimer that way. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you start off maybe first on the stage and you're doing a lot of that stuff. But at some point, usually in these games, the actor is then moving into a booth to record any ancillary stuff that they didn't want to record on the stage. Maybe for uh, just for better quality or for having things that aren't performance capture based. And if you're an actor who is only familiar with working on the stage or only familiar with working on with the camera, or you kind of are presented maybe with those same challenges where a voice actor may not be familiar body wise, but um, it, it, are you? It, that's why I feel like maybe there's this middle ground where education is so important for all actors, so they can have opportunities for everything that is available, especially in this very volatile video game industry right now. Do you do you think that there is maybe more of a trend now? Because it, it didn't really exist um, within the past five years, really, uh, for that type of education to be available for, like, performance capture um, classes or mocap classes or an overall arching um, acting uh, conservatory that includes these things? Are you seeing more of these? Are you requesting more of these? What is the conversation education wise so that people are best equipped for all of these opportunities available? So the, I, I think you said it all super well, and I don't think I need to correct any of it. Um, <laughs> Great. We're on a good start. <laughs> <laughs> it's all like tools in the tool belt, right? Yeah. Um, and so I do think that there is, um, there is value in learning all of these tools. It is a hundred percent why we started Help Academy, which is, as you kind of said, a, a subdivision of the Help Network. And the entire goal of it was to 
demystify and educate um, on the nuances of, of game and game needs across the spectrum, not just for acting, but the, the main education we've had has been on the actor side because that's our, our main experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, I think it's helped significantly in people just being able to take one or two classes and really up their skills and be able to handle those auditions um, with the base knowledge that they need. Um, mm. The the hundred percent of the reason I wrote the book too was for that purpose was because <laughs> when I, I started teaching kind of just before the pandemic in person. And then when we went online, I found it helpful to have um, presentations and kind of like a slideshow at the mm. top of my classes that helped me keep my thoughts. And I felt that it was also really important to have um, coverage on the language that we use. Because that's just something that not everybody knows. Yeah. And so a lot of times, you know, there's questions about like, what's a, a bark or <laughs> um, an emote or things like that. And so just kind of, or even what's the difference between performance capture, motion capture, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, even uh, with that education. <clears throat> so just kind of trying to demystify that and, and help people uh, understand that it is just tools over the last, uh, you know, having that, having that presentation helped me realize that if people were able to read that information before coming into classes, they would be so much better equipped to handle those classes. And it's a much more accessible way. And, um, at the base of everything, you know, the help network and help Academy are mission driven. We are looking to up- represent, nope, we're looking to uplift underrepresented actors and talent And so to be able to make it accessible was very important to us and not gatekeep information. Yeah, I feel like that's something that um, especially in this career, because it was I I feel like it's so and like you even said, it's so brand new in a way like voice voices in video games while they've existed to some degree. And you have a whole history, which was very fascinating to go through as well at the start of the book, um, where it's it still is relatively new. And a lot of these things are evolving at such a rapid pace where a standard that might have been in place five years ago is no longer something that's like really happening for whatever for whatever reason. So having like I really don't think and I'll make this comment and I want to make sure we talk about the distinctions between the, the different types of captures um, like I, I had a book. It should be somewhere here. Maybe my other room. It's called The Business, uh, um, Acting as a Business by Brian O'Neill. It was one of the first books I ever got when I moved to New York, and it covers like all of the things like your headshot, what backstage.com is, how to reach out to agents and managers. And so, from an on camera perspective or a theater perspective, there was a resource for me there, but it was still a little bit niche at the time. And I always was recommending that. But in terms of voiceover and video games, Tara, pa- uh, Tara Platt and Yuri Lowenthal have their book. There's other, you know, I want to be a voice actor. All of these things which you mention in your book. There were those types of resources, but nothing was really focused on video games, which is now becoming kind of a, um, a very sexy thing for a lot of actors to get involved in. And you're seeing celebrity be involved in. I just went to an event that Squ- uh, Square Enix had for their new game, Final Fantasy 16, and it was a... It was like a, a celebrity spectacle, and I feel like that trend is only going to keep increasing, increasing, increasing. The people that want to be involved, the the scale at which these things are made. Um, gosh, I'm I'm talking so much, I forgot what my question was now at this point. But anyway, I'm glad you have all of these um, resources in this way, and the glossary of terms, like you were stating, like there's so much unknown uh, for what has not been existing. Here we go. I'm back on my track now. Uh, did you feel like there was that empty void specifically for, for video games that was like the impetus to really get pen to paper here? Yeah, I mean, when I was putting those presentations together, there just weren't even definitions that were helpful. Mm. And so, I mean, it was a little scary to like go out and define things, but I also am one that's like, I'm a human and I make mistakes. And so like, (laughs) call me on it and I'll fix it. But it doesn't mean that it should stop me from putting this out there, which was, it was a thing for me because it's hard to like put yourself out there as like the, the knowledge holder or the, the, you know, the knowledge subject matter expert, if you will. Um, but I, I do have the background and experience that, uh, 
made it possible for me to write. I have a very unique um, kind of history and my path has allowed me to see every different kind of facet of what's happened over the last kind of 15 years, Mm. uh, which really allowed me to be able to write it. I think there are a handful of other people that could have written the book, but they, uh, they're really busy and we're all really busy. And I was the one that was just like, darn it, I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it was, it was a passion project. It is not a, um, a money grabbing project. It's, uh, it, I, I say it because it's like, It takes a lot to write a book, to publish a book, to put it out financially, yeah. and um, it, it is definitely a, a a passion of mine that I just really wanted people to have the access to the information. Yeah, I want people to get the audition and be able to be like, oh, let me look it up. I just needed it to exist. Yep. My partner is a writer, so I understand the whole thing that goes into getting something like that made. So it is very long and it takes a lot of effort, you know, revisions and all, all like it's just is a lot of work. And, and I thank you. And I'm sure I'm sure the studios thank you because the more educated people are going into these jobs, especially people who are first time on the job. I remember so many times specifically, I can remember the first time I ever did ADR. I was working for a company in New Jersey when I still lived in, in New York and they were doing uh, Turkish dubbing for like Turkish soap operas. And um, we were uh, working on that. And I just had no idea because I came from a theater and, and film background. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. And if there was like a resource at that time, you know, this is 10, 12 years ago now, that I could have looked through for a lot of things, I just would have felt so much better in myself. And that first hour that I spent just saying, all right, when are they going to fire me? I could have maybe (laughs) performed a little bit better. And the, the punchline of this whole thing is they didn't call me back. Because I wasn't, I don't, I think I wasn't ready. I don't think I have the experience enough and they were such a small operation. They didn't really have the budget to sit there and like spend that time with me to, to get it right. Uh, That is such an excellent point right there. Is that because a lot of times, especially earlier in the, in the dev, uh, kind of in game development, uh, it was the budgets were not as big yeah, and they needed people to do a lot more. And so there's, and there still are a lot of utility jobs, utility actors. They're not, it's not a pretty job. It's not necessarily like the one where you come out and you're like, I love my job. It's like hard, (laughs) gritty work sometimes, but it is, it, that is the way it becomes sustainable is being open to those as well as the other types of jobs. Yeah. I was just talking about this with a friend and I, I do a lot of uh, uh, live action dubbing sometimes, and that process I can f- can be a little bit slower sometimes because it's a lot more strict with the the, the lip flaps that you know they really need to make sure that things are right, mm-hmm. that things make sense, um, and so that process can be you know you record let's say a minute and a half of or a minute let's say of, of a stretch of time depending on. Uh, who the client is or who the director is, how they like to work. But in my experience, I've done minute chunks at a time to this karaoke bar. And then after you've done that minute of thing, they're spending 15 minutes trying to place that. So you're sitting around in a padded room and I have I was expressing like, you know, sometimes and you have to lock your phones away sometimes for NDA reasons, you kind of sit there and you're a little bit rocking back and forth going, you know, like, all right, it's that hurry up and wait for voiceover. Um, But you do these things because um, it creates, I mean, everybody, to my experience, everybody who's in this industry is working not just from an actor's perspective on all different types of jobs, but everybody even behind the scenes are trying to get their paws on on various different things. So I feel like it's helpful to to do those jobs to give you more skills, resources to to work with various directors, you know, learning on the job type of stuff. Um, Do you see that as someone working in your space where are you heavily focused in video games at this time or do you like being exposed to the various different mediums you can have the opportunities to work on? Um, We'll work on anything, especially at help, like anything that comes through our doors. Um, And we're always finding that we're uh, involved in the boundary pushing stuff. And so people call us when they don't know who to call. Uh Um, And especially just 
VR or um, we did, I did a VR film that's coming out at some point next year. Um, there is a, there was a VR concert, the like Pentakill live concert from League of Legends that I worked on. Uh, there's a lot of like really cool kind of uh even like uh what's it called hologram stuff sure. there's there's a lot of different areas and we love the new we love the the different and we love the questions that make us go hmm how are you going to handle that yeah um i remember a couple of years ago being on a stage when they had um, eight concurrent facial capture rigs going at the same time. Whoa. And it was like really a big deal to see like the eight faces up and it just like technology wise, you know, data pull wise, it's just a big feat yeah. to have that all going and not have interference and have everything work. Uh, and it was just, you know, I, I love that stuff. It takes a lot of hands, I feel like, to make even something like that work. Um, I, I would love if you, if you don't mind, to we just talked about a lot of different things right there. If you, um, maybe the the bigger things specifically, um, defining maybe what some of those are, and maybe some misconceptions, because I think a lot of people confuse those terms, and I think they think motion capture encompasses like all of those, but I know there are specificities. If you wouldn't mind maybe breaking those down for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was one of the areas where I found it really hard to find definitions. So mm. it's not super surprising that people don't have them right off the bat. Um, but motion capture is typically capturing the body and it's not capturing the face or the voice. And a lot of times we do this like in commercials, they do it a lot for any kind of like motion capture work that they might need. Um, they will do it in, uh, for any kind of background characters, for any animation sets for, uh, characters that do things that are kind of more stunt like than a, uh, than a, um, actor might be able to handle who's sure. doing the performance capture even. Um, so a lot of stunt people do the, the motion capture side of things. Facial capture is capturing just the face, and it can happen in the volume, which is the sound stage basically that um, motion capture and performance capture happen in. Uh, it can happen concurrently while the body is being captured, which is called performance capture, or it can happen in the voiceover booth. Um, and it's just a separate facial rig. Um, sometimes it's a helmet with like a, a light on the end of it and a camera. Sometimes it's just a camera in the booth for animation reference. But there's a, a bunch of different ways that we capture faces. Um, and then performance capture is the total performance. So they're going to capture voice, face, and body, sometimes fingers, eye tracking, things like that. And that's the, you know, the goal for a lot of the AAA really kind of cinematic games is to capture full performance wherever possible mm. and now traditionally those are being done at least from the uh, performance or motion that's where you see people hooked up to these jumpsuits with the balls and stuff on there have you seen um that technology evolving or do you have any sort of hypothesis for where that is eventually going to lead because we see it in vr you know even google just released their version of um like a vr headset to, or like a consumer vr headset um and there's been variations of uh virtual reality rigs in general are you seeing things change from a, a mocap and pcap perspective and do you have any theory of where it's eventually going to lead it's all going like, you know, better, faster, smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the biggest changes is that there's a lot of teams that are able to do um, motion capture specifically in their office spaces. Um, they can bring cameras kind of anywhere and set them up where they need to be set up. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot more mobile than it used to be, mm. um, which allows them that then like a lot of the animators are the ones that are performing the anim the animation sets, if you will, which are like running, walking, jumping, crawling, um, swinging a bat, whatever it may be that the characters need to do in the game. A lot of the animators, they know what they're looking for. So they just either put on a suit or... Um, or get in the volume that they may have. Um, there is suits that are getting smaller, or not smaller, but uh, that don't require the camera. There are suits that have sensors on them. They're called X-Sense, and oh. they, they can basically capture the movement without the cameras. So there are people that have invested in that. Um, I've, I've heard about different schools who are looking to pull those suits in and uh, start 
teaching that in acting schools and whatnot. Mm. Um, it's definitely making it more accessible. It wouldn't be what um, the high quality avatar folks are using. Sure. Um, but it makes it accessible and it makes it so that teams across, you know, the world are able to access this, which is all, which also means that actors will eventually be able to access the technology in their area and it won't be so limited to LA. Yeah, that's, um, that's huge. To it it is here. huge. Yeah. And it's, again, tool in the toolbox. It's, it doesn't mean that you're, you need to be the specialist, but just like understanding the thing is great. It reminds me a little bit because I came from a film production background, too. And I had a friend who was a, you know, a bit of a gearhead when it came to he's a cinematographer and he would have, um, you know, he would have like a, a, a steady cam, which is, you know, makes everything look, you know, you walk with that. And he had that as one of his tools in his toolkit. And I think the same way that we have our own home studios and we have the various capabilities i wonder if it eventually will lead to like you know if you have your own i mean maybe the studio will provide these to some extent but you know whatever version this is going to eventually take form into where having something like that capable from your own home studio might be um a a possibility to be able to do or at least a space where if you get sent a rig you can do something from from home because so many times i've even been on uh, Zoom calls with clients and they're recording it to get the even from that limited capability and you mentioned this in your book having good lighting having a good camera so that way when you're working you're you're ch- you're kind of giving your clients as much as you can to to make sure that they can get everything that they may or or possibly will need even if it's not used because sometimes they say oh we're gonna do this just in case and I always feel more comfortable knowing I got a great light I got a great setup I'm never gonna worry about that I'm not gonna worry about running to B and H or what's the B and H equivalent here in L A I don't know <laughs> we don't have a good one <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you know whatever your local camera and lighting store is so that is really fascinating that it's um. Things are moving in that direction. I was going to uh, ask you quickly, too. Do you have, I guess it's a two part. How important at this time in the world is it for people to have hands on experience with performance or motion capture before they get into a job like that? And is that something that your the help network is offering as a class? Like what is in terms of like someone who's brand new is just just hearing these terms for the first times, maybe like what is the first steps that someone should take specifically for this type of stuff? So for performance capture, there isn't a ton of education resources out there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, People are starting. There's um, Victoria Atkin, PCAP with the Pros, and the Help Network does have... um, does have uh, classes. We just started doing some in-person PCAP classes um, in LA. So that is exciting to to start doing again. Um, But... It is not required for you to take a PCAP class in order to book a a job. Mm -hmm. A lot of the education that's out there is mocap related. And I think that's um, one of the reasons we wanted to distinguish between them. And the reason that there is a distinguish between the the mocap education and the PCAP education is that mocap is typically hired through the stunt kind of uh, casting train if you will (laughs) and so there's different casting directors that specialize on different things and while occasionally i do get asked for people with special skills and stunt abilities it is not uh what people are typically hiring a casting director for yeah they'll hire a stunt coordinator who then just picks the people that they know are good at the things and there's a level of trust there um so i just like to make that uh kind of caveat because no, there no. are a couple different mocap schools that are great and they're great for learning how to use your body and um and being able to really kind of embody c- characters and creatures and all that type of stuff um but they do typically hire through the stunt track for that kind of stuff which mm. those are a great resource for yeah on the performance capture jobs they're going to be hired through typically agents and then um actors access breakdown services casting networks the same kind of way that a, a tv or film or um other project might might get cast yeah and so it's a lot more kind of in line with that especially since they've been uh, all of the developers have been kind of prioritizing having more kind of cinematic actors in their cinematic games and whatnot. Yeah. 
I, I do see. I have friends who are stunt people. Like they do that is their main job. And um, I guess it's kind of an interesting thing. And I'm, maybe you have an opinion on it. It's like I see. I have a, a friend. She is primarily like a, a stunt circus performer and stuff, and she does that stuff all the time. She has a lot of combat training, martial arts experience, and she's you know weapon trained. So she gets called in a lot for these Call of Duty military style games to do a lot of those work uh, that work. And sometimes she gets elevated to. Uh, a, a, a character position, you know, sometimes things evolve, especially when the creatives are in the room. They're like, oh, wait, you know, this person, maybe they can do this and say that and, and, and things of that nature. Um, do you see that as like, because you don't really see many people who are like pursuing an acting career, also pursuing a stunt career. How do you feel about those two worlds um, from, I guess, the the, the capturing um, category being kind of blending i think that um in other industries it may be kind of looked down upon to go for like stunts into to guest star if you will (laughs) um but for us i think it's a great pathway yeah um and people will find you to be reliable you know one of the stages that uses stunts all the time is like a sony stage yep and um there are plenty of actors who have kind of made their careers by going from stunts into on screen, if you will, I don't know, to a primary role um, on those games because they were reliable, great to work with on set, always coming in with a great attitude, always knowing what they were supposed to be doing. And people love to hire people they love to work with. And those sets are really intimate. They're not, you know, it's not a hundred people. It's usually 25, 30 people. And, um, the devs are are not like ego film directors yeah, like yeah, yeah. they're they're just like folks trying to get their work done and they're excited on days where they get to work with actors and then they get to like bring it to life those are their favorite days and so it's just a really like warm fun environment a lot of times and and so yeah it's uh I don't even know where I was going with that. <laughs> no, I think I think what you're saying the the pathway from stunt the to pathway, yes. Yeah. So it's it it is. Oh, that's yes. Thank you. So the pathway is there because you're making these relationships, and then people think of you. Yeah, and another thing. I mean, gosh, I could reference this book all day because it had that much of an impact on me. It's like being a good person and being somebody that people like to work with, someone who's reliable and punctual and knows their lines, and all of these things have a big effect on these people who are oftentimes working on various things, and I. Think think when um, a studio or a creative finds somebody that they know like checks a lot of those boxes just from like a good person perspective they're like let's remember that person let's let's bring them in for for various things especially in this world of voiceover where like just like from a creature perspective you can play a thousand different creatures you know like and if somebody's like yeah i really like working with this person i'm going to remember them it it can go a really long way do you do you i, I mean you obviously write about it in the book but I, is that like one of the the main things that you uh try to preach to the people that you're teaching or you're working with don't be a dick <laughs> it's really it's so simple it sounds like if it but the moment egos get involved, like we are not film, we are not TV. And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, the actors are not the most important thing in a game. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important that people walk in with a team player attitude. Yeah. And sometimes that's not how uh, they've come up. And so uh, it's just, it, there's too much work to be done. Mm-hmm. And there's so many times and opportunities where you can just think of someone and pull them in for a job um, that it's it's just not worth, you know, messing with any of your relationships. I have a client right now who was one of my interns and, and early hires who hires me now <laughs> to do the casting on their projects. And they are working with my first boss in games wow they're on the same team that and is it's so it, real it's vi- it's so real so it's all about relationships i've never burned any of those bridges yeah. i you know i think it's really and and you know casting is the same thing we we are we're bidding on every gig yeah. no one just like hands you things once in a while but really <laughs> we're we're 
we're trying to get every job just like an actor. And so um, those relationships are everything. I would love to talk about that a little bit qu uh, quickly for anybody interested in that, the, the casting director um, part of this industry and, and everything that entails. If if you don't mind, and I know it's in your book, I know it's in your bios, but for, for people who maybe do not know and are curious about casting, maybe how, because I know you started off as a production assistant. Can you maybe talk about like how you got your initial interest in even doing that to how you wound up becoming um, – or, or working on casting for the first time because I know you kind of got elevated through the ranks for lack of a better way of saying it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I have always loved uh, entertainment, TV, theater, musical theater, being in New York, all of those things, um, but not really loved being on stage. Mm. Um, I've, t I've toyed with it. Uh, and in certain, uh, capacities, like, uh, in, in the 12th grade, I was in Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh -huh. So, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, but mostly I really liked being behind the scenes. I liked helping like choreog choreography, choreograph things, yep. um, or assistant direct for, you know, pr uh, be like a ma stage manager, yep. stuff like that. Um, I studied recording arts in college and I thought I was going to be in the music industry. Um, but it was when Apple was, uh, selling songs for 99 cents. <sighs> and so it was just not really a good time. Um, I thought I was going to work at a recording studio potentially or have a record label. And it just like was not at all, um, the industry to be going into. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the same time, I needed a college job about halfway through college, and uh, I famously got denied a job at Starbucks the same week that I got hired as the receptionist at Treyarch, which is the Call of Duty developer. Yeah. So I started at Treyarch as the receptionist. It was a part-time job. I worked there all through college. I worked my tail off. Um, I was very underestimated because I was a woman. Um, I was one of seven women in a company of over 300 people. Mm. And, uh, and I was 20 years old, so it was a very interesting environment, <laughs> but it was a good one. Yeah. And I was, they helped me quite a bit in elevating my career, like you said. So after being there for two and a half years, I moved into the sound department. Um, and I started working on dialogue management basically, because at that time, Audio directors, sound designers, they wanted nothing to do with the dialogue. It was the red redheaded stepchild. It was the thing that they had to deal with, but they didn't really, it mm -hmm. wasn't in their job description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was so much other stuff that they were trying to deal with that it was really an afterthought for a lot of people. Yeah. And so when they kind of added me to their department as a production coordinator, naturally I just started managing the script and managing record sessions and then starting to get all of that set up. I would record because I had a recording arts background, I'd record audio on the mocap stage. We were doing all sorts of old school projects like um, Big Red One and things like that. Like just, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and so I got to learn like every aspect of making a game. Yeah. And including implementing and adding dialogue into a game and testing and playing and, and just knowing how it worked. Um, I got super burnt out <laughs> doing that mm -hmm. because it's a it's a crazy schedule and and crunch and it was before there was a a lawsuit about overtime and so <laughs> there was no overtime so it was just a it was a lot um, <laughs> so I left and started working at sound uh, service companies most of which do not exist anymore but I I went from uh, Technicolor to Sound Deluxe and now uh, right after that I went to Formosa Interactive which. Uh, my business partner, Chip Beeman, and I started from, from just us two and grew to about 25 people before leaving after five and a half years to start the Help Network. Mm. And so in that time, towards the end of my time at Formosa, I was able to get my paws on a little bit of casting um, while kind of in the dialogue management position there. Um, up until then, we tried to have a... a a position where people couldn't necessarily blame us for bad casting because we were the recording studio. <laughs> we wanted a separation. Yeah. Um, but because the casting needs were getting so crazy, um, 
I, I saw a need for more casting specific people mm -hmm. and I don't have a goal to be a director. I'm not a story person. It's something that it, it took me a second to realize that um, while I might have written a book, I don't even consider myself a writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love finding people though. And I think mm. like recruitment and casting are very similar. Um, and I, I do a lot of finding great humans to yeah. fulfill positions. And, I, and uh, so I was able to kind of start that at Formosa and then doubled down on it um, when we started help and grew to doing all of the amazing projects I've been privileged enough to do. Yeah, and you guys have worked on some phenomenal titles. I mean, one of which is, I think, most of the world is playing right now. You know, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This game is um, one of my favorite games of all time. I'm really savoring every moment right now. It's been my companion for traveling right now, and I'm so happy that I have it. Um, Cyberpunk, which was one of my favorite games performance-wise. Um, you guys did a phenomenal job casting that it was really um that were i mean night city you feel like a real living breathing city um of real people which i really enjoyed and the i mean again anyone who's played that game the performances are exceptional um so you guys do really phenomenal phenomenal work um i wanted to ask this as you just mentioned it before in, like, I, I can only reference this to, like, theater, you know, I, I think of agents and casting directors for on-camera stuff in theater, you know, they would, like, they go to plays or they go to improv shows or they're watching TV series and they're, that's how they're maybe finding new talent. Um, is there a version of that that you're doing, whether that's watching video games, playing video games, or going to improv, or perusing social media? Like, what is... Are, do you do that as a casting director? Like, what is the... Do you have any methods for finding talent? Can you give, like, break down a little bit of what, what discovering talent is in this day and age for you? Yes. Um, all of the above. Uh, I probably don't see enough live theater, but it's a goal for sure. And I, I've been lucky enough to go kind of recently to a couple of things. And um, because an actor is an actor is an actor, I'm always looking and listening. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter. She watches a lot of animated shows sure. and live action shows. And I'm always looking up people. Um, I went to an event on Saturday that an actor did a little monologue for charity uh, and turned to my casting assistant and we were both like, oh, that job where they don't speak in and where it's like all emotes, they would be perfect for that. Mm. We're like, So we're always thinking about it. We're always, always thinking about it. But I use we do a lot of searching on the Internet and that's probably the, the biggest way. And then we make ourselves super accessible. Yeah. Uh, and I do a lot of teaching. Um, and so Google, Instagram tiny bit of TikTok, but not necessarily for hiring more for like, I'd say networking, if you will. Sure. Um, but it, Instagram a little bit for hiring, uh, especially if it's something difficult, um, casting networks and, and actors access breakdown services for, for pretty much everything else. Yeah. So I think it's, um, I would imagine it's very important to have access and you talk about this even in the uh your book god i mean there's just so much resource <laughs> it, there you. it's really it's really great and i i highly recommend people check it out i mean I'm, I'm gonna link it in the description but you can also get it on kindle you can get it in a hard copy i have it in both um i think it's really helpful in the kindle version because you can do control f which is basically if you're looking for certain things you can just go straight to it um uh gosh what was i just saying I, uh, with your materials you know whether that's your demo reel your headshot your um, and that was actually a really, while I'm saying it, that was a really poignant part that I see really neglected in the industry is like a good um, headshot for various different reasons. And I think voice actors tend to think like, I don't need that. And like, I don't need to dress up for work. I can show up in sweats. I feel like those are a lot of things that like are like misconceptions to a certain degree where I don't need to be presentable. I don't need to have um, like a headshot that could eventually be used for marketing or, you know, not just from like a vanity perspective, like look at me and look what I'm doing, but how could I be a, a key part of marketing this game that I'm a part of? Um, you mentioned a lot of those things. So having a website, having all those things, that's a, a important thing you would say, especially on the various breakdown services sites. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you're amazing, you cannot do any of the things. <laughs> right? When you're amazing, you can Fair. break all the w- rules. Yeah, yeah. I always say that for, for my auditions, too. It's like, I'm going to give you all these parameters to follow. If your performance knocks it out of the park and you didn't follow some of the parameters, yeah. I'm not one of those casting directors that's not going to pass it along because you fu- named the file wrong. Uh-huh, yeah. I'm trying to get the best performance for my my client yeah. and so if i deem that what you just did then even if the framing is a little weird i'm gonna pass it on it yeah. with that you know note we're not perfect so yeah <laughs> but neither am i and i don't expect people to be so um i think having accessible materials whether it's on your website whether i think it's funny i, I should do a post on this hmm. a lot of people don't realize that you can just redirect a domain so you can get you know paulcastro.com and redirect it to your imdb you can yeah. redirect it to your actor's access profile if you pay for one of those so i think people get in their head that this website has to be like a three thousand dollar um idea when really it's just you just need to be able to f- find you and it should be under your name and, yeah. and and make it accessible. That's brilliant. And I actually that is so brilliant because I think people get daunted by, you know, paying for hosting for a website can be very expensive especially if, you know, times are tougher, you just don't have a lot of disposable income to be able to pay uh what do they these things cost like sometimes $300 a year or whatever it might be but you can just simply link that to your IMDb or your actor's actual usually- resume. And that's like twenty dollars a year. Yeah, that's so brilliant. Um, you should do a post on that because that's, that is actually. Very, <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's so good. Um, I, I I think that there is uh, no time better than now because things are like you're just saying accessible in that way. Do you feel like there are any um, whether from gear or just things that people think about this industry like misconceptions about voiceovers specifically with video games? Any things that you wind up having to correct a lot or people saying you need this if you don't have this you can't do this. Like I see a lot with microphones. I see a lot in like breakdowns must be this and um, I know that can go both ways. Maybe it's just an incompetent studio not knowing that like I talk about this is one of my favorite microphones it's a AKG C414 XL2 I know it's a lot of things that mean nothing to people but it's a fairly comparable mic to uh the TLM 103 that I have back there so do you feel there's any like misconceptions whether on like the client side or on the actor side that you have to clear up or clear up a lot or you wish you could clear up for people and now is a good time to do that um, there's so many yeah. so that I will just select one, yeah. <laughs> um, which I think is, is really, uh, a, a trying to save people from wasting money, um, which is about reels. Mm. So demo reels are always a hot topic. Um, people always want to talk about reels. I personally don't listen to many reels unless it's literally because people want me to listen to their reel and yeah. give feedback on it. Um, however, my one of the people I cast with often, Melissa Grillo, does a ton of reel casting. Mm-hmm. And she gives these lovely gifts of jobs based on reels mm. so that you didn't even have to audition for. So in, in that respect, reels are great to have. If you're going to have an agent uh, or want an agent, an agent is going to have a requirement on what reels they need you to have in yeah. order to be with them. That said... People run to record a reel as if that's the thing that's between them and a job. And it's absolutely not. Um, And really, the acting is number one. And you should be running to an acting class and not to record a reel um, and pay $3,000 for it before you're ready. Yeah. Um, I think reels are a bit uh, of a dated concept from a day and age when we were delivering hard materials to people. And, you know, a personal website can host all of that stuff, which is great. But you can also now do samples. Mm -hmm. And I say samples because it's something that you can do without production value. You don't need any music. It just needs to be simply edited. And you can do separate ones. So, for example, you can do a narration sample or a commercial sample 
or a character sample. Mm -hmm. And um, those can just be one voice. It can be your natural voice. Uh, and as you get better, you can replace those. Yeah. And it allows for you to have something to show people without having to put together this thing that you're going to have to redo in a couple of years anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, uh, you see it a lot. Um, I, I think it's a, a couple of different things about it. I think people think that that's like the golden ticket to things and that may or may not help you get an agent to a certain degree. The commercial demo, I hear a lot of yes. agents in my experience on this podcast. Yeah, let me say that I'm talking about video game yeah. reels specifically. The commercial reel is kind of inevitable, but even still, rushing to it is not smart. Yes, and we see a lot of these classes that they offer after a one-week course of your first attempt at any acting let alone voice acting you're gonna get your two thousand dollar demo reel and it's really a, a n not efficient use of your money um yes. when you could do so many better purchases like acting classes to help you get better for the jobs that you're gonna yeah. think and I've seen this even with on-camera stuff to a degree where they're moving away from demo reels in that fashion where it's you have uh, scenes or it's this samples basically like here is my moment as playing a young punk or here's my moment as a doctor or here's my moment as a lawyer and on the co-star and guest star level that's a lot more effective for an agent pitching than sitting through four minutes of like <laughs> – uh, comedy scenes where they're like we're casting law and order here you know like get to the dramatic stuff so i think that's a probably a very similar practice for a lot of voiceover stuff um this has been so informative and helpful and i think your book is truly a, a blessing that we have accessible to us in this industry right now i wish it was around when i was starting i probably would have made a lot less mistakes than i had uh, very simply that glossary, glossary of terms, having that handy um, at any point in your life. I, I was doing a job recently, and I'm sure I've heard this before, but I just didn't know what it meant at the time. And I wound up looking it up like in the middle of a session. The director kept saying um, to the engineer, and I thought, I thought they were saying it to me. They were like, um, penultimate. They said the penultimate. And I was like, I'm like, pen ultimate. I'm like, is that so and, and I could have simply just said, hey, can you just tell me what that means? But I didn't want to look like a loser. <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, does that mean I have to do this like with more energy? I'm thinking this is a note for me when it's he's referring to the take to, to for the engineer to use. So things just as silly and stupid as that. Um, I wish I'd known. It's just like silly stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Have you experienced things like that with yourself or with actors? Oh, yes. <laughs> I yeah. know exactly that, uh, the usage of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. So uh, it's so helpful and useful, and um, I really cannot recommend it um, anymore. Um, just for the fun of it, can you just talk before we end here? Just w one of the last two things here. Um, Zelda, as it is such a phenomena right now, can you talk to me for you as um, a company, how you, I know you worked on Hyrule Warriors and maybe that had something to do with it, but how did you wind up getting that job as a company? Because it is one of the most prolific titles, I think, of all time right now. And that's kind of a crazy thing to, I think, maybe digest as a, a casting director, no? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, we feel really lucky. Um, and it, it is all about relationships. Uh, Chip and I have been working with Nintendo since, uh, we worked together at Sound Deluxe, mm -hmm. which was, you know, many moons ago. And, uh, when we were at Formosa, we were responsible for Breath of the Wild. So, uh, we had a really positive relationship with them. Um, we did Hyrule Warriors during the pandemic. And it was fully, like, uh, pandemic restrictions plus remote. Mm -hmm. uh, and we we killed it. <laughs> we did an amazing job. I would say so. And, uh, and my team is amazing. We have amazing editors. And um, we work with a lot of partners. That's how the Help Network works is we have um, partner studios, partner editors, uh, and editorial teams that we pick and choose for each project so that it's not... Um, 
it's bespoke to your project. Yeah. And we picked the studio we wanted to work on it, the editors we wanted to work on it, um, the engineer, the note taker, very specifically. And then we gave them, uh, you know, options for directors based on their spec. Uh, and they made that decision. And then we made basically this amazing team together. Uh, we feel so lucky to be trusted. Mm -hmm. We did a great job of keeping it a secret for three <laughs> plus years. Yeah. Um, my colleague Hari Lee was the voice director on it and did the script adaptation and she hadn't uh, had too many game credits. Mm. Uh, so justifying her presence on new games without that credit being out was, was a little hard until it came out. But then everybody was thrilled to see it. So yeah. it's been it's been a beautiful. People are so kind about the game. The cast did an amazing job. The team, I mean... All of the voice work is amazing in the game, but the game is amazing because it's a, 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 a feat of brilliance. Yes. Like, I mean, it's just the mechanics alone. It's just so unique and so amazing. And the, the, the love and care they put into it, it's just so prevalent on every you know frame yeah and all fronts like you say there is it is really a masterpiece in that way where it's so innovative it's so interactive and fun and new and builds upon all the successful things that breath of the wild did but when i thought things couldn't get better specifically like from the voice acting perspective it did and you have these phenomenal talents like you know matt mercer in this game and you know really just like it it grounds what traditionally prior to breath of the wild zelda games were traditionally unvoiced for a large um percentage of them I, I can't think of any before breath of the wild that really had anything besides the hey you know or ha yeah no the, the efforts of things and to see this game venture this franchise venture into the the voiced realm and done so beautifully and so um grounded and real and um empathic it really it hits you on all the right chords and uh that that starts with a great cast and finding great talent and, and giving them the chance to, to shine and working with great directors to let them go when they need to or steer them in the right direction so this is just a, a kudos as a fan and a, a thank you as for most people here and in the world um who haven't been enjoying these games so thank you Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Seriously. <laughs> um, I would love to finally ask you here quickly before I let you go. Um, the book has been out for a year now. I know probably not a ton has changed in, in any way, but, you know, the same way I've seen, um, you know, Tara Platt and Yuri Lowenthal, they made like a, an addendum to their book. Has anything, has there been anything in this past year of experience since writing it that you were like, oh, I would have added that in there, or this has changed a little bit. Is there any anecdotes that you would pin to the book that maybe someone like that isn't in there that you would be like, oh, that would have been a great thing to put in there? Has, has there been anything illuminated in that way um, or no? Um, I am already working on the next, hopefully for next year or the new year after, uh, just kind of an update yeah. because I think things are moving pretty quickly. Um, but I just, I really want to expand on the, the performance capture, motion capture information in there. I felt like a, uh, I only kind of grazed the surface of it and that there's a lot more that can be talked about. And especially as I've been teaching it more, um, yeah. and just having those kind of ideas, uh, with in tandem with Hari, who who does a lot of the kind of performance capture casting with me, mm -hmm. um, having a director to bounce off of has been really educational um, on the teaching front, mm. and so it's it's just added a lot of I think kind of her ideas too that I would include in, and then I definitely would want to include more voices uh, because I am you know one party i'd like to include more uh information from other casting directors other directors so that uh, all opinions are kind of counted yeah um but i didn't want that to prevent the release of this yes so that was kind of you know a large consideration was just i can talk to everyone it's just gonna take me a really long time because i also have you know 12 jobs <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well as a resource as it stands i think it is monumental because this did not exist i really want to to stress that and i think it is imperative if you are again an actor is an actor is an actor but if you have a thirst if you have a passion for video games it is one of those things where 
I, I, I wish, I really wish I had it. I wish I didn't walk into those rooms not knowing what certain things meant or how, you know, how things worked, even from an audition perspective. Like, you, you talk about takes, there's so much more. Go buy and read the book for yourself. You'll see everything I'm talking about here. I hope I've convinced you the importance of it otherwise. Um, it, it was really helpful for me, even from someone who had been working in the industry for a while, and I know it would be invaluable to someone who is... Uh, very newly venturing into to this sort of field, voiceover, all uh, video games specifically. Um, Julia, thank you so much. Is there any specific links that people, um, we'll, we'll, we'll include them, but is there anything people should be looking forward to, any specific classes, any websites that people should be aware of that you would like to direct people to? Sure. Um, the Help Network has all of my latest classes. So helpacademy.com is where you can find all of those. Uh, we are doing a camp, which is a uh, in the in the wild, uh, in person, two day, two two and a half day uh, camp that's coming up in October. So that that's on there and. Uh, and then you can also find my information at juliabs.com and uh, on Instagram and the Tiki Talkies and trying to, trying to grow that, that TikTok audience a little bit uh, without actually posting anything, which is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand that feeling of like, I know this is important and I want this to work, but I also don't want to dance, you know? <laughs> yeah. I just want people to buy the book. Um, yeah. And so tell a friend to buy the book. It's not expensive. Uh, share the love. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that could could use it before their next audition. So yeah. it's worth every penny. Seriously, people, uh, check it out. Julia, thank you so so much again. The book is the art and business of acting for video games. It will be in the description. All of that great stuff. Get it in paperback or on uh, the Kindle app, which you could literally just click that like buy now with one click, and it'll pop right up on your screen immediately. So there's no excuse. Check it out, and you can also I think read a section of it before you do it. So I'm telling you as somebody who talks to a a lot of actors and they always ask me questions about these things i will do less work if you read this book i guarantee it <laughs> so you're doing me a favor julia uh have a fantastic rest of your day your week month year all that great stuff continued success to you congratulations with everything on this and everything to come i'm so excited for whatever we else have in store and um i really appreciate you coming on the show it really means a lot to me thank you paul it was lovely thank you all right take care now bye uh, yes, I'm so glad I got to have somebody of her specialty on the podcast. It is so informative. I really can't preach this book enough as someone who is sitting here talking to you all about how you can further progress a career as an actor in these specific mediums. Like, there is a, a, a book here that has so much of the information that I'm trying to get out of guests. You'll have this little Bible um, in your hand. This is Zelda. This is also kind of my Bible here. And uh, <laughs> really great job and game that they worked on. But um, really check out the book. Um, it's a fascinating uh, historical perspective on all things in the industry and how things are changing, evolving terms and conditions and NDAs and agents and managers. Just check it out. It's you. If you're working in this industry or want to work in this industry, that information will be consumed and utilized one way or another. It is worth every penny. Um, thank you all. Please like, subscribe, um, and help us sustain this podcast as we do. Um, a lot of you are not subscribed, so if you're not and you're watching these episodes, please click the button. Uh, it would help us continue to make these episodes as high quality as possible. Um, leave us a review. Uh, subscribe to our Spotify uh, subscriptions. We're going to have some stuff with that very soon. And um, it's another way of supporting us. But I love you guys. Thank you for hanging out, listening, tuning in, all the fun stuff. I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>